Welcome back to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm your host, Hannah Matlock, and we are here today with Dr. Susie Gronsky, a licensed doctor of physical therapy, a board-certified pelvic rehabilitation practitioner and health coach. She's a leading expert in pelvic pain and pelvic health. Dr. Susie is the author of Pelvic Pain, The Ultimate Cock Block, as well as the creator of an exclusive men's pelvic pain course to bring greater awareness of men's pelvic health issues to other healthcare providers. She's the first to bring a men's health curriculum on board the American Physical Therapy Association section on women's health. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you to all the viewers and anyone who signed up to the summit. This is gonna be so awesome. So can you first start by telling us what led you to specialize as a pelvic floor physical therapist in male pelvic pain? Yeah, this is a great question. And honestly, it's after being in practice for so long, I had a lot of men reaching out to me asking for help. Uh, at the, which point I saw that there was a huge need to serve people with penises and there was a lack of available resources to help them. And because of this, there usually was a lot of unnecessary suffering. So I, was, I felt really grounded to take on this mission to help this special niche. And I also feel very comfortable working and treating people who have penises. So this is why I decided to focus my practice to help this patient population. And what is it like treating men in specific? Right. And that's a great question. So typically, we all have the same parts. They're just organized differently. And I think the major difference in the way I treat than maybe some other therapists is just dis a, com a comfort with treating this part of one's body, especially when it comes to the opposite gender. So I'm not shy to look at the testicles, feel the penis, help the person on the table work with their body parts. And men also have a prostate, which women don't. And that goes into another you know, big topic about, you know, do pelvic therapists do prostate massage? And is that really warranted in the clinic? And, and generally across the board, no, we don't do prostate massage. But if the gentleman wants to partake in that in terms of their own curiosity or with their partner, that's something that we as therapists know very well to educate that person on how to do it safely, teaching them about their body parts, and then exploring with curiosity, love for themselves and whoever they're doing it with, or just solo. So I think that would be the major difference is really com how comfortable the practitioner is with touching and treating this part of someone's body of the opposite gender, and also just knowing a lot of knowledge about someone else's body parts that you don't have, because clearly I'm... <laughs> I'm not a, a person that has a penis, but you know, understanding the physiology and the anatomy is something that pelvic therapists do very well. And that in, in turn helps that person understand their body. And if they understand their body and how it works, typically the fear and the stress that comes with pain is diminished just by understanding how everything works. Does that answer the yeah, question? That, <laughs> okay. And that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Can you tell us what some of the causes of pelvic pain in men are? Yeah, so I wish I knew a definitive answer. I'm sure many other providers out there who are helping men with pelvic pain, I wish they knew the definitive answer as well. But in reality, there isn't a, single, a known single cause of male pelvic pain. From what I've read and experienced in the clinic myself, it's typically multifactorial. And what that means is that there's some correlating factors, but they're not necessarily causative. So for example, digestive health issues like irritable bowel syndrome, uh, gut dysbiosis, autoimmune factors, neurogenic mechanisms, direct trauma to the genitals, maybe it's post-surgical complications. There's also infections like STDs or E. coli, Epstein-Barr virus. Sometimes it's an unidentified pathogen because there's so much that we still don't know. Um, histories of unwanted sexual experiences, medical trauma, pelvic muscle dysfunction, and I have bunny air quotes here, <laughs> because all that means is that the pelvic floor or the pelvic muscles, they may not be relaxing or coordinating or functioning in the way that is optimal for that person. 
And I believe that pelvic floor dysfunction is typically perpetuated or made worse just by the sole fear and anxiety around you know, having pain down there. And also when you go get help, scans usually coming up negative, antibiotic treatments typically fail. And then they're often told that there's nothing else that, that, that can be done to help them. So, so really that's going to create a lot of tension in one's body. And naturally the pelvis holds a lot of real estate for someone, right? There's a lot of importance of the genitals. And when we don't know what's happening in our bodies and when things do hurt, that tends to create a motor response of protection. Things are just going to get tight and they're going to protect you until the issue is taken care of, or at least you have some answers to deal with it. Um, on that note as well, when all that happens, neuroplasticity changes in the nervous system and the immune system often lead to heightened states of sensitivity and protection from the neuroimmune system. Um, and like I said, correlating factors of um, psychological issues like anxiety and depression, helplessness, um, which I feel is often a byproduct of living with persistent pain. And as I mentioned before, for all those factors, it is a scary thing to deal with. So in my opinion, it's a combination of multiple factors involved. Uh, and it depends on the type, uh, the t situation of the person and the, the help that they get when, you know, to either continue to perpetuate the symptoms or to dampen it, essentially. And as you said, oftentimes when women or men are able to find the right practitioner to help them and find the right, get, receive the right diagnosis, get the right treatment, it helps a lot to reduce the anxiety that is surrounding the pain and the depression and all of the other symptoms that come along with having chronic pain. So it's really helpful for men to be able to find a pelvic floor physical therapist like yourself to really be able to address the root cause of the pain that they're having. And besides for the obvious, can you talk a little bit about how treating men is different than treating women, whether it's in regards to the techniques that you use or um, the approach in, the treatment, in your treatment? Sure, absolutely. It's, treating men is not much different than treating women, honestly. Um, in my opinion, you treat the human being in front of you. And sure, they might have their private parts organized differently, but essentially treatment is individualized to the person in front of you, no matter what their gender. So that's my approach in, in a comprehensive plan for that person. And that's how I would go about doing that. But yes, you obviously have different you know, genitals that are organized differently. And like I said earlier in our conversation, it, it depends on the comfort level of the person treating the person who needs help, but also it's the comfort level of the person receiving the help. So there has to be a hundred percent complete consent and awareness of what the exam entails and that reassuring that person that nothing should hurt or continuously perpetuate to hurt when it comes to treatment. So that's really, really important. We shouldn't be hurting people even more. In my opinion, I think we need to bring greater awareness to the fact that people who have uh, penises might not be uh, keen to doing, you know, internal work. You know, what does that entail? They might even deter treatment because they don't want to have internal work done. And that what all that means is doing internal rectal work, which is quite common in the pelvic health world. So I think, again, it's really normalizing things, destigmatizing things, and allowing that person to take the lead in their treatment, and you're just facilitating and coaching them through the process. You're not necessarily, you know, power over them or telling them what to do, because essentially, we, it's not our role to, to, to determine what's best for the patient. They know what's best for them, and you're just kind of helping to facilitate that from that person as a collaborative effort. Can you walk us through briefly what a standard session would look like? Yeah, for me, so again, everybody does their sessions differently. I'm sure you're, you're very familiar with that. And I'm sure the audience is very familiar with that. If you go to one person, they might have a different opinion and the way of doing things. If you go to the next person, they might give you something completely different. So I'm just going to ex explain how I do things in my office and my clinic. Uh, it really first starts with a thorough uh, health history and getting to know their story. So the first, my sessions are about two hours long initially, like the initial session. And all I do in that first beginning part of our session is really give space and allow that person to tell their story. 
because that's so important. I feel that's really lacking in the conventional medical system for various reasons. There's a lot of limitations and barriers to that. But essentially, it's really important for that person to be able to express themselves and to tell their story and to be heard and validated. So I think you're setting up the container, a safe container for healing and for them to feel vulnerable and to trust you. So that's really, really important. So that's number one. Number two, I walk them through education about what does an exam look like? And I give them the option. This is not what has to happen during this exam. But this is some of the common things that are performed doing, during a pelvic health exam. Which do you feel comfortable starting with? It's always giving the option. And again, you're obtaining consent. You're, you're, you're getting consent. If they have the option to say yes, they have the option to say no. And you have to respect that as a clinician and have patience and work with that individual to help them get toward, you know, to recovery or whatever their goals are for that, for that session or, or the time working with you. So that is really important. So education, getting consent. And then if everything goes well and we're, we're trusting one another and they're super comfortable, then we do a full body assessment because we know the pelvic bowl or the, or the pelvis is the, the middle of us, but it, it's not just living in a vacuum. So we have to look at the whole person's body and where they're really feeling protected and guarded. You know, again, you're communicating with that person's nervous system. And, and every time you touch their body, you're providing information. And so the goal during an evaluation and treatment is to just map out the areas that hurt and map out the areas that feel good and then working with the person in terms of figuring out what the best next steps are. But really, it's you, you don't want things to hurt more. There might be areas that might be more sensitive. But again, we're just mapping. We're not hanging out there. We're not, you know, digging an elbow <laughs> somewhere, you know, or putting a finger where they don't want a finger to go because that is a very invasive treatment protocol. And if someone's not used to having their bum evaluated or having a finger in their, in their butt, um, and depending on their, you know, their gender or what their preferences are, you know, this might be a very vulnerable uh, thing to go through. And, and the last thing you want to do is create more trauma for them or unwanted experiences because let's get real i <laughs> i've been there where things you know like a massage therapist would go too deep or something like that right and you, you they ask you is this okay how's my pressure and you want to say no but what do we normally say oh yeah it's good it's okay <laughs> so you know i take that into consideration and i again try to normalize these situations like yes you're going to have tension like in those muscles because this is the first time we're meeting so you know, again, you're normalizing the situation for them. You're trying to create a sense of safety and calm around all of this and, and really moving them forward to a better place. So sorry if that was a really drawn out answer to your question. <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. Thank you. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, so the, the aspect of the treatment where you're talking and understanding their history is really amazing, but then in terms of the physical component, if there's any men listening who want a better understanding of what exactly the physical aspect entails. Can you just yeah. touch upon that? All right. You can tell me if you can see this really well. This is great. I love this question. Can you see the yeah. pelvic model? Okay. So essentially what I do is I tell um, the person in front of me and say, here's your anatomy. So if we were to lie you on your back, you have your sit bones right here. Everything in between is called the perineum. So this is where the genitals live. This is where the anus is. And all the skin and fat is taken away and there's no nerves or blood vessels on this model. But essentially what I, what I tell them is, this is where I'm going to go. I'm going to use flat finger pads, very soft, assess what your tissues can tolerate to touch, to pressure and to temperature. And so here's the base of the penis. The full penis isn't there, but here's the base of the penis. And all of these are muscles and muscles have nerves and blood vessels that go to them and connective tissue and fascia. So really we're just assessing the environment of this part of your body and mapping out what is sensitive and what feels good. And essentially we do, because the urethra, which is the pee that you, or the, the tube that you pee out of lives, you know, we look at the penile tissue. So I do feel from the base of the penis all the way up to the glands penis, which is the tip of the penis, to again, assess if there's any tenderness, sensitivity, changes in tissue, 
Um, there are lots of things that may be going on that we need to address in a session. Uh, and then we do, if they're okay with it, we go on to doing an internal exam of the deep pelvic floor muscles, which are located. Let me take out the bladder and show you the inside of the pelvis. I don't know if you can see that, but um, those are the deep pelvic floor muscles. And that's why therapists will work internally to see if there's any tender points uh, within the pelvic bowl itself. And then the prostate lives there too. So essentially I will also feel the prostate and the mobility of the prostate. If again, if that's where, where that session will take us and if that's okay for the person on the table. So again, we're just mapping out areas and getting, we're painting a picture of what's going on and what could, what potentially are the main driving factors or pain mechanisms at play. Does that, is that helpful? Very. Thank you. Yeah, and sure. so this is kind of in reverse order, but can you talk about what symptoms men come with where this type of work could help to treat their pain? Sure. So you can have anywhere from abdominal pain, groin pain, issues with bladder or, or bladder pain syndrome. Uh, you can have incontinence. You can have penile pain or burning, uh, fullness uh, in the rectum, uh, pain with sitting. Those are, those are mostly the common uh, umbrella type symptoms that I usually work with. But you also have a, a variety, again, of you know, for that person, it could be a combination of all those things, or maybe they have difficulty with sexual function. So for example, having an erection is painful or a post ejaculation or orgasm. You know, those are some of the things that uh, men will, will complain of with, with pain. And then sometimes again, it just, it might not be pain, but oftentimes they'll say, well, I feel like my genitals aren't part of myself. So they'll start to notice like it's feeling weird or maybe it's um, hard, almost like in an aroused state when, when they're not really aroused. Um, maybe there might be some tissue changes to the actual, the genitals themselves, um, or maybe they have testicular pain or fullness, you know, so those are some common issues that I'm not probably getting them all, but some of that comes to my head right now. No, that's super helpful. Thank you. And the theory is that most of these issues after more serious causes are ruled out is that um, it's stemming from, from the musculature and from overactive pelvic floor muscles. So the work that you do helps to relax the muscles and calm the nerves and reduce irritation and inflammation so that these symptoms can heal. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we're looking at the neuromuscular system, but also I want to kind of point out that it's not just a muscle issue because nerves are controlling your muscles right. and there's something much greater to pain. It's very complex and it can get messy because pain is a feeling. It's a, it's a sensation. It's not necessarily driven from the tissues themselves, although there's a contributing factor for sure. They're not felt and interpreted at the, you know, they're not interpreted at the tissues. There are no pain, you know, sensors in, in your skin, they're just messengers. And those messengers are picking up on changes in that environment in the tissues around them, and then sending that message up to the spinal cord and brain, where the brain is ultimately making the decision to protect you or not. So pain is, is ultimately protection. And the goal of any treatment session or recovery should be to address all of the factors, the biological, the psychological, and the sociological factors that might be influencing this person's experience. And how long does treatment um, at pelvic floor physical therapy usually take for men to see improvement in, in their pain levels? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because as you know, we're all individual and unique, just like our thumbprints. So there is no average timeline for healing. I would say that the general rule of thumb would be if you're working with someone in a practitioner or provider, you should be seeing incremental changes in your, in your health or at least getting towards your goal. So things should be getting better. How fast they get better, that depends on a, a bunch of factors. But it should be getting better each week. You know, something should be changing each week. And granted, things do change. And sometimes they're really tiny changes, but they're but changes nonetheless, you know, and you're adding drops into your bucket to get to where you're going and you're doing it one drop at a time. So that's kind of how I like to explain it, if that makes sense. 
Yes, definitely. And you do see pretty remarkable change with your patients, right? I do. Yeah. And like I said, the, 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 the timeline and the time frame of which that happens, some people, you have that great, you know, one session and they're like 95% better. That's awesome. You know, and they don't need that many sessions subsequently. But like I said, there's a lot of deeper rooted factors that might be entrenched in one's experience with pain. So we have to be patient as practitioners, but also as patients patient with the process because it is a process. It might not be the find it and fix it cure. And it might be very, it might not be that quick for you. And I know when we're in pain, the last thing you want to think about is how long is this going to take? I want this gone like yesterday. That's completely normal to feel as a human, but know that we're all here to support you through the process. Um, because that process, it may take some time depending on the circumstances for that individual. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And I know that for women, often women who have pelvic pain, it takes them months, years, if not 10 years to finally receive a proper diagnosis and to find a pelvic floor physical therapist. Is it the same with men? What is the average amount of time? If you can kind of give us a rough idea of how many practitioners practitioners they've seen before they come to you and how long they've had their pain for? Right. And that's a great question. And I almost want to say the better question would be, you know, at what point should someone with pelvic pain consider seeing a pelvic health specialist, right? How do you get to someone sooner, as you mentioned? In my opinion, if symptom, if you're having symptoms and they don't go away in a few days, get help sooner than later. Because what ends up happening is that you begin to manifest a lot of worry and anxiety over the issue, especially since it's related to your genitals. And from an evolutionary, evolutionary standpoint and from a physiological, just basic functional need, it's a body part that is essential for daily function and procreation. So naturally, your brain is going to be weighing the world much heavier when it comes to anything alarming down there. Um, and not to mention that the meaning that your genitals have to your existence, your gender roles, and human sexuality, and how that just, again, entrenches in your, the integrity of you and, and how you're living in your world, your experience. So there, there's this, you know, pelvic health is not just a body part. It's that person who's experiencing this and all that meaning that it brings to them and in their world and how it's impacting them. Um, and so, yes, get help so get help sooner than later. Typically, what I see in my practice is that men will often go through a battery of tests and specialists, much of which are very invasive and, in my opinion, not necessary, um, and failed treatments. And so they'll often see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven practitioners before they even get to me. And it's surprising to me that urologists and internists and other healthcare practitioners are not, are not referring to pelvic health practitioners. Um, they're often, again, and I just had a gentleman not too long ago come visit me and said, I had no idea that this was even an option. I was told that there was nothing else that they can do. And that's just not acceptable these days. I feel like the more information that we can educate the community, educate uh, people in pain of where to find quality resources because we all know there's a lot of stuff out there but just understanding that there is help just because one practitioner wasn't able to offer you a tool or something that helps you with your recovery it doesn't mean that there isn't help for you so again a drawn out answer to your question that was great that was great thank you and what doctors usually are the ones to refer patients to you and what other specialists do your patients often see and what does the communication with these specialists typically look like? Okay, so I will say that most people who find me and come to me are from good old internet and Google. So they, I don't really get too many referrals from physicians or doctors, which again, I'm very surprised, but people who do find me, they find me because of the content that I have floating around on the interwebs. Um, but doctors that do refer to me are typically um, MDs, urologists, primary care physicians, functional mes medicine providers, um, nurse practitioners, physician, assist physician assistants, 
um, acupuncturists, massage therapists. So there's, there's, you know, it's, it's an endless array of choice of which one can have access to information to get you to the person that you should be seeing which is, you know, if it's a pelvic health therapist, that's great. And like, and I don't want it to make it seem that, you know, pelvic health is the be all end all and it's going to cure your, <laughs> you know, cure everything. No, it, it takes a team, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a team to support you just depending on the type of support that you need. And as I said earlier, what are the major influences, you know, that are contributing to your experience? So as part of the care team that you work with and you send patients Two, can you elaborate on what this looks like and what other specialists are often involved in treatment? Yeah, so my network of wellness team or support team that I have are is a functional medicine provider who, and functional medicine is just a practitioner who essentially does a really good job of looking at your biochemistry and your health with a really wide lens. You know, they're getting to the to the root causes of illness to disease and, and not just looking at things with, you know, for symptomology, like, oh, you have a symptom, let's do this for that symptom. No, we're trying to get to the root cause and functional medicine truly believes that a lot of the illnesses and diseases can be reversed with supplementation, dietary and nutritional changes, um, meditation, a lot of this quote unquote integrative medicine type of thing. So I do work with uh, someone in town who's fantastic. That person's on my team. I also work with sex therapists and sex counselors because, you know, as we know, we're dealing with private parts and genitals and sexual health is really important. If there's um, a deeper psychological, you know, um, groove that needs to be unwound or, or process a little bit more, whether that's solo or with a couple, a sex therapist can be great. Um, and also a psychologist or, or a counselor who, who understands pain and works with people in pain. I think that's really important as well. So um, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, those are some that have been shown in the literature to be very, very helpful. I also work with a hypnotist uh, hypnosis is really great because it gets to the subconscious and it, ha it has been shown to have some promising results with pain. Um, who else do I work with? Um, acupuncturists, massage therapists. Um, who else do I refer to really well? I think that, you know, that's a, that's about it that comes to mind. I'm sure I'm missing someone and I apologize, but that's who's coming to mind. <laughs> And those are all really important people and help with pelvic pain a lot. I know for women, those are similar similar um, specialists that pelvic floor PTs refer to as well. So I could only imagine that they would be equally as beneficial in, in treating male pelvic pain. And in your opinion, why do you believe that there's so much shame that, that men have so much shame surrounding these types of pelvic health conditions and how can we as a society change this? I think it's really important that men are comfortable talking about these problems and they're open about it and that in turn will of course help them to receive proper treatment earlier on and not suffer for so long. So why do you think that men feel this way and, and how can we change this? Great. I love this question. I think it's my favorite question. So, so far, it's awesome. So there's not many available resources, as I mentioned earlier, for men. And the resources that are available are not really easy to find. So when good quality information is hard to find, that usually requires more research, asking around. And for, for a person who's shy about their genitals or has no idea where to go, this can be very intimidating for them especially if you're dealing with a very intimate part of your body. And I always say this to my patients, but let's face it, talking to your friends about your penis pain isn't the same thing as talking to your friends about an injury you got snowboarding. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's a different context and, and, and that's going to lead to, you know, different uh, health seeking behaviors. Okay. Um, there's also the potential for this, po this patient population of feeling shame, I think, of seeking help from a women's pelvic health specialist. You know, the, the pelvic health therapy started off as women's physical therapy or women's health therapy. And there are many clinics that have, you know, created their business around this, you know, women's health, 
uh, and, and women's specialty. So I feel that that is kind of putting a damper on someone's, especially a person who has a penis, to go into uh, a place that treats women. And, and that could be maybe a little bit of, of a shaming thing for, for that person. Now, I don't say this for all people, but this is just my own experience of gathering uh, what my my patients are telling me. Um, and, and on that note, just even being treated by a female might be something that's not comfortable for them. And so now we get into, you know, various gender roles and, and who feels comfortable with, with what practitioner. And so there just definitely needs to be more of an option for, uh, for treatment of various different kinds of practitioners for people seeking help, especially people with penises seeking help for pain. Um, and I also alluded to this third point about fear around treatment. Uh, in my opinion, most cisgendered males feel anxious about internal work. They've never had it. They've, they've never explored anal work or, or, or they're or on themselves or with a partner. And now they're going to get treatment for something that hurts. So it could be really scary and, and, and really not having a clue of what to expect from pelvic therapy. So I think that those are the three um, big ticket items around maybe some of the, the barriers or shame surrounding the conditions of, of male pelvic pain. Um, the, the second answer to your question is around, well, how do, as we, how as a society, can we get, can we get this patient population and, and practitioners alike to be more open and vocal about this? Well, I think the biggest barrier to this is that there's silence between the medical providers and those seeking help from them. You know, health professionals aren't asking the patients and the patients are too scared to, to even bring up these concerns sometimes around sexual health and function. And believe it or not, across all medical professions, there's a lack of knowledge and training in current pain science biology, sexual health and education. So I think, you know, bridging the gap between the silence and the education and the type of education that both practitioner and patient are receiving is really important to help bring down some of these barriers and, and get society to be more open and vocal about uh, addressing these things when they do occur, or just knowing about one's body and what can occur. Because the more you're equipped with knowledge, in my opinion, the less things are scary because you're really normalizing it. Like you're not alone. This is quite common and there's treatment for it. And if you know that that's an option for you, then oftentimes these symptoms do not perpetuate as long as they typically do. And se you know, several years of perpetual symptoms. And just because you've had something for seven years, it doesn't mean that you're done for and you're throwing in the white towel. It just means we haven't found the ingredients for your recipe. So... And I really believe that the more men become comfortable with talking about these types of problems, the more they'll realize that so many other men suffer from similar conditions as well, and they'll feel less alone, and they'll be able to know what treatment is necessary. So even though it's hard to become comfortable talking about these topics, it really is important, and it's not as embarrassing as it may seem because they are unfortunately pretty common issues. Right. It, and they are, of course. Pain is part of the, it's normal, it's part of the human experience. Uh, although that is normal, it certainly isn't normal to be living in persistent pain. And so that's one thing I want to definitely denote that pain is normal, it's part of being human, and we shouldn't be afraid of it. It's just, you know, again, pel in the pelvis and, and our genitals, it just adds another layer of complexity. And, and we don't, like you said, Hannah, we don't really talk about it. And we're not really aware of like, well, what is normal down there? And what things should look like? Or how should they feel like? And, and so, you know, as you know, there's just a lot of mis misguided information out there. And, and most people are getting their education off of the internet and, the, and TV and social media. And so it's just getting good quality information. And I think as a society doing better, doing a better job of being a well-educated consumer and not believing everything that you're reading <laughs> is another thing, you know, because anyone could write, post anything and just really scrutinizing, you know, the, 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 the subject matter that you're, that you're reading and getting quality information from a, a qualified practitioner. And is there any other advice that you have for men or women, both patients or practitioners who 
are involved in this field and either want to learn more about treating male pelvic pain or if there's anything else that you want to share or think that they should know about male pelvic pain. Yes. So for patients, I definitely want you guys to know, don't let yourself get stuck in a rabbit hole of failed treatments, hopelessness, and helplessness. This is hard. I get it. Definitely seek the help of a qualified pelvic health specialist who understands pain and can help apply practical treatment strategies to your life. And secondly, therapy doesn't have to hurt. And if your provider or providers aren't listening to you, fire them and find a new one. <laughs> like, you're in charge of your body. You're in charge of your experience. And if it's not going the way that you are hoping for, then there's no sense in continuously doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. For practitioners, being human gets messy and we all suffer and know what the struggle is like. So we should definitely be more kind, more empathetic and compassionate as others find their way out of the muck too. And we definitely don't want to treat pain with more pain because hurting people is not okay, whether it's intentional or not. You know, we need to, it's our responsibility to find ways to use non-painful approaches to help them. And lastly, words are like toothpaste. Once it's out, you're not putting that back in. So please use your words wisely because we just don't know how much our words impact the person that's receiving the message. So that's my advice for practitioners. Thank you. Thank Thank, you. Thanks for letting me plug that in. Of course. Thank you for taking the time to join us and speak about your expertise in treating male pelvic pain. It's really, really important. And there aren't as many practitioners like you who who hopefully one day there will be. So thank you again for specializing in this field and for the work that you do. And for everyone listening, where can you be contacted? Yay. Awesome. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and I'm sure you guys will post all that in the Pelvic Health Summit information. I wanted to say that I also have a podcast. It's called In Your Pants, and there are video recordings now, which you can find on YouTube. So make sure to subscribe wherever you'd like to listen or or, or watch me. Um, and in addition to, I also can shameless plug, in addition to the Men's DIY Pelvic Pain Relief Program, which is an online program that you can do out of the comforts of your own home, I'm also creating a women's DIY Pelvic Pain Relief Program. And it's coming out at the end of May in honor of the Pelvic Pelvic Pain Awareness Month. And it will be super cheap. It's priced Um, at an introductory offer of $99. So you can't beat it. Lots of information. And again, um, hopefully can help people who are suffering with pelvic pain. So thank you for letting me share that. Amazing. Thank you for creating all of this wonderful work and resources that will help benefit so many people who really need, need this. So thanks again. And thank you for your time. Thank you.